Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming on Power Talk, thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And uh, what an honor it is to bring back a cat who, uh, you know, sort of came up at a time when uh, you were kind of free to express yourself and your own individual sound, serve the songs on on albums that became concept albums and like he told me in prior interviews you could put on an album and play through one side of it and say my god this cat's talking about my life and so it was relatable uh everybody had their own unique sound and people were ultimately trying to be themselves they weren't trying to conform uh or bend towards commercialism uh and and you know i haven't talked to my guest in in, in a little while and we've been on this extended pause for quite some time where the bandstand has been taken away from a lot of cats. And uh, it's had a profound impact on someone like myself, who not only as a journalist, but as a patron of the arts, uh, really craves the healing of the live vibrational music. And um, I do believe that the immediate family band uh, that he is part of um, will be... Uh, will bring smiles to people's faces and hopefully uh, will be a a modicum of dance music that will allow people to um, find their groove instead of sort of sitting there and uh, staring at somebody's facility. We know that my guest does not play 20-minute solos, and this band has the opportunity to inspire, make people happy, and I sure hope I can get to San Juan Capistrano in in November to... to, uh, to hang with these guys and, and, and catch a groove. Danny Korchmar, mm-hmm. welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Great. Good to be here, Jake. <clears throat> how has um, the pandemic, how have you been affected by it coming out of it now that we're sort of coming back to some kind of normalcy? There's, I think there's more anger and violence now than than I've ever remembered. But And so that's kind of hindering the the feeling that it's a safe environment to come back in, but I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what your gut tells you about the live music experience coming out of coronavirus. Well, I'm hoping that, um, you know, that we, if things settle down and that people are able to come out and listen to music again, certainly in, in groups, it's a very, uh, it's something I think people need. There's a, it's a need, there's a need for that. And they're always, well, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there always has been. Um, so let's hope that that, it, it, that things come back together as far as far as how it affected us the band was supposed to go out we had an album all ready for release that we had to put off we had a tour that had to be uh, postponed and just like everyone else just like all the other bands you know so we were in the same position so we used the time to write and record which is what we've been doing uh what's definitely what i've been doing because i used the time when the band was off to uh, work on music work on songs mm-hmm. um I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you guys are, you know, with a live performance? I mean, I, I guess the, the, you know, the idea of like, I remember going back to the to my interview with Dergy, and, and I don't think I realized this exactly, but the section used to open a lot for Crosby Nash or, or things like that. And a lot of the crowd sometimes would be, uh, puzzled, but they recognized that you guys were going for it. I mean, you were giving it your all, and it clearly it was like, you know, you weren't trying to be, you were trying to be yourselves, but you were stretching out. Is the immediate family band, I mean, if people are going to come to the shows and they have the album, should they expect the songs to be played like the album, or have so, have you realized that some of your uh, compositions have uh, lend themselves to, uh, I know you don't love to wank it, but where you can actually stretch out? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, we've got three guitar players in the band, all of whom are good sol- soloists. But basically what, we, what we're more about is an ensemble sound and songs, especially songs. We take a great deal of pride and interest in our songs as opposed to, uh, um, you know, uh, guitar soloing prowess, even though, like I said, we're all good soloists. Uh, I think we've had enough of that, <laughs> to be honest with you. you know? <laughs> no, <I'm... laughs> no, I mean, okay, and, uh, I want to ask yeah. you about that. Why, why, no, nah, you don't got to, the street cred of Korchmar, Postel, and uh, Wadi, nothing needs to be said there. I- explain mm-hmm. the weave of three guitars. It seems to me like, um, you know, all of you have rhythm chops, but can you just explain how you guys work in tandem? Because... 
Uh, it seems almost like uh, an extra guitar. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, <clears throat> we all form. We all have different functions um, in the band. The three guitars. Now with Waddy, I've been playing with Waddy for almost forty-five years, and he and I have never had very long conversations about who plays what. We generally just hit it, and we know how to stay out of each other's way and how to complement each other. A long conversation between me and Waddy would be, well, uh, I'm going to go low, you go high. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, that would be a long conversation. Uh, as for Steve Postel, he's got chops that, uh, very, that are very different than Waddy's and mine. He was trained a, as a classical guitarist, so he has a lot of finger-picking chops, which neither Waddy and I really have. Although Waddy's getting better at it. <laughs> um, and, um, th so that's his thing. Also, he's the guy with the pedals. In other words, he, he's the guy that creates sounds and textures things like that. Waddy and I generally plug directly into our amps and don't use a lot of effects. Of well, Waddy uses none, and I use practically none. So um, Postel is the guy that comes up with effects, sounds, pads, you know, groovy stuff like that that Waddy and I aren't doing. So that's how the three guitars work together. And between all three of us, we, we make a hell of a racket. Oh, no, I dig. I mean, I, I just, but I, I want to be, I mean, we're talking to a cat who immersed himself in a non-formula trip, a spiritual jazz scene. He happened to be lucky enough to be in New York at the time. He could go see Coltrane or Rasan Roland Kirk. And I, so my question is, like, if I came to San Juan Capistrano, like, it, like, does it does it ha do you ha do you and Wadi have to solo on every tune, or is it just sort of random? Like, like I mean, will you just play a couple? Like Miles, you know, used to come out and play just three notes, and the band would scam. I mean, is it just part of my issue with? Um, and I know you're 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 geared more towards songs and serving songs, right. but like, is it is it is it possible that like on one tune it'll Cooch will just solo and 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 then it, like there's some more randomness to it, or is is it how do you how do you guys stay stimulated and not make it a formula trip? Well, you know there are solos in the band, and there's solos on a lot of the songs, and we pass them around. There's uh, some tunes where all three of us solo, but they're short and. Uh, I think that's a, a good way to go because it breaks it up. Uh, then there's some tunes where Wadi or I take longer, more extended solos. But again, nothing like long jams, nothing like blues rock or long, you know, jams like totally, that. We don't totally. do that. No, I mean, in, in some... About, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, as I said earlier, we're more about our songwriting and, and, um, and about our ensemble playing than we are about long extended solos or trying to, you know, blow everyone out. That's... Uh, you know, that's what that's what we're good at. Remember, you know, we all came up playing with the greatest songwriters ever, the greatest singer songwriters of our generation. So that's what we're attuned to, and that's what our our main influence is. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, what was the first set? Do you remember the first time you you session you were on with Wadi? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, Lou Adler called us to come play together. Uh, and Wadi and I had been hearing about each other, but we hadn't met yet. And uh, so Luke called us, called on us to go play on an album being made by a guy named Tim Curry, who was a terrific actor and a great guy, and also a very good singer. And he was making an album. Luke called um, uh, Wadi and I to come play. Actually, it's funny because Russ and Lee were the rhythm section. Wow. Wow. But that was the first time I played with Wadi. And um, we bonded over reggae right away. I mean, we, we became very, very good friends <laughs> that, that day. And uh, we both realized that we loved reggae tremendously, and that was all short. And I think one of the first tunes we did was had a reggae feel to it. So we were off and running, and that was it. And we've been, you know, we've been playing together ever since, and we've been very, very close friends ever since. Well, I've been doing a lot of shedding because, uh, um, you know, Korchmar entered the studio scene in, in L.A. in the uh, right around 70, 71, 72, but... Uh, you know, I wanted to play this audio, name that voice for you, um, and then we'll come back and, and break it down. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. The first uh, number one record I was on, uh, I had a solo, and it was uh, The Rocket Pneumonia with John, by Johnny Rivers. Wow. And the mm -hmm. solo that I played... I bent up too far on a note. It was a new guitar. We were all we were all trying to get 335s because Larry Carlton had a, such a great sound. The 335. Yeah. So I had a 335. I didn't know very well, 
and I overbent one note, and I just went with it and kind of bent back to it, but even a little bit more in tune so that it seemed like seemed like I meant it. And uh, there it was, you know, and it, sure enough, we had taken another take, and none of the, the take wasn't as good as the take that he kept, which had that on it. So, And Joe Arsborn still rib, ribbing me about it. I saw him at the NAM show 30 years later and said, remember that part? You overbent that note. Wait, I just want to say... In this all right, Mr. Korchmar, who is that? Well, first of all, I can't believe that Dean Parks ever played a wrong note in his entire career. <laughs> uh, so I find that very hard to believe. Well, he is a magnificent yeah. musician. Dean is one of the best ever. He's ever. a fantastic musician. Yeah, and I have nothing but respect and affection for the guy. He's he's brilliant. You know, and I and I'm not. I'm just not going to let you get away. I mean, because Spinoza, who uh, you know, Murata grew up i mean spinoza hit a clam on right place wrong time arif mardin mm -hmm. and dr john kept it uh mm -hmm. rock and pneumonia he he clammed it they kept it so i want to know the cooch clam that wound up not necessarily a number one record but it became a hit you know you you maybe you still cringe listening to it but it made the song <laughs> oh man so first of all I mail a lot of clams. I know. So no, I do. That's fine, man. Really difficult. <laughs> picking, picking out one, one is going to be really difficult. I'm, I would say that uh, I always had a hard time listening to my solos. Uh, I was never never happy with them, ever. Hmm. And, uh, when um, when It's Too Late, Carol's It's Too Late came on, um, that's the solo I played on that track. I played live off the floor. Um I mean, I had no idea I was going to be listening to it for the rest of my life in every <laughs> CVS and every gross grocery store. And, every and grocery every store ever, man. Uh, and uh, for a long time, I would listen to it. And I'd cringe. I'd go, wow, oh, that's terrible. What a shit solo. What's the matter with you? And uh, I had to live with it for years. Now I realized it was good. It was a good solo, and it worked for the, uh, the song. Also, if it got past Carol and Lou, it must have been good because those people are, you know, the best of the best. Well, I mean, so I, I'm surprised to hear that because you knew very early on, and a lot of people, I just remember Michael Shreve from Santana, he went to see Mahavishnu and, and at their peak, when possibly even the tour you were on with them, and, and, and it was like Billy Cobham's force threw, threw everybody up against the wall, and Michael was there, right. and he was like, I'm not, I can't do that, and I don't want to do that, and, and that's, and you mm -hmm. seem to understand that from an early age. So I, I guess, can you talk about how you learned to actually appreciate what you brought in the solo? I mean, context, have you always just been somebody who has a heart, sees, sees the things as glass half full? How did you become comfortable uh, with your own voice? Because like, I would say that's, a li I mean, when, you know, to be that self-critical would, would sort of take the fun out of it in some ways. Well, you have to be self-critical because you have to expect a lot from yourself. That's true. One has to expect a lot from oneself to be any good at playing music. That's a good point. On any level and on, on any instrument. Uh, I would say this, considering what Michael said, uh, is that Philip Roth quote, was quoted as saying, your style is what you can't do. Mm, right? Wow. Your style is Whoa. what you can't or don't do. And uh, that, to me, makes a lot of sense. You can't be all things to all people and expect to have a, an actual style. You listen to Jimi Hendrix play, you don't mistake him for anyone else. It's Jimi Hendrix, absolutely positively. Is the stuff he can't do? Yes, Jimi Hendrix could have, was never going to be able to play bebop, you know, um, or be able to play like Pat Martino or one of these amazing, you know, jazz guitar players. Um, so he didn't do that. He did what he did. And uh, I think that's the essence with me, too. I fell in love with uh, uh, listening to Steve Cropper and, and uh, Cornell Dupree and Curtis Mayfield and those cats and Skip Pitts from Memphis and basically the way where guys were playing on soul records. I was loved soul music when I was growing up in the, in the uh, late 50s and 60s and was really drawn to it. And it influenced me tremendously. The guitar playing on those records really influenced me more, more than the English guys, you know. In other words, I grew up listening to the same music those guys grew up with. I, got, I grew up listening to the same music that Keith, Keith and, and uh, Eric Clapton listened to. So... I'm less interested in hearing... If I want to hear the blues, I don't listen to Eric Clapton. I listen to uh, Muddy Waters or, or uh, Buddy Guy or, or Jimmy Reed. I'm interested in the first generation of blues. And uh, uh, so that and that was my inspiration, and that's where I'm coming from. And, that, and that's what I learned. 
You know, so Louis, I mean, Dean, Dean Parks talked about when he got into the studios, he came from North Texas and he said that a lot of the arrangers did not know how to arrange for what would be considered rock or pop music. And a lot of the, four, right. a lot of the beboppers, you know, guys like Howard Roberts or the Wrecking Crew Cat, Tedesco, like they could play the rock, but they hated it. Um, right. And I, can you just talk as best you can remember, like when you, how do you, how did you, get, who did you team up with? Because Parks was always talking about like there would always be a rhythm player and a lead player, and with like him and Carlton, it just was like water. It was similar to you and Waddy. But like when you first mm-hmm. got in. Um, how, can you talk about those moments of like just being a team and serving the song and recognizing like, okay, that person's got it and I'm going to just play rhythm. Who was your, who was your cat when you first got in? There was no one cat, you know, when I started doing this, I played with a variety of people, a lot of, you know, very good. One guy I loved to play with was Jesse Ed Davis. Oh. I just loved him. He was a dear, dear friend of mine and a great, great player. And I did a lot of dates with him. And again, it was very little conversation conversation knew how to play with each other i'm the active player so i'm going to listen to what's going on around me i'm definitely going to listen to the song and singer first okay what is now now what can i come up with that's going to help that's going to help this song move it along and it's going to help the singer and inspire the singer to uh you know sing as, as brilliantly as they can and that's what i think about uh i play with a variety of people but you got to remember I'm, I'm nowhere near dean dean parks is one of the greatest session players that ever lived i was never never that that uh, I never did as many record dates as Dean, nor do I have the facility. Dean, if, because he came from North Texas State, he could read fly shit. He could read anything. And uh, so that came in really handy. He was doing movie scores, jingles, stuff like that. For record dates, learning how to play part on electric guitar on a pop record, you got to come up with something. You have to come up with something. That's why you get hired. I got hired to be me. In other words, I didn't get hired to play... Uh, heavy metal or country or this or that. I got hired to play my style, play what I did. And I was lucky in that way. I'm more of a character actor. You know, I just have, I have a way of playing. And if you want that, you can get it. Oh, dude, I did, dude, come on. That's, but you know what I'm saying? It's not about, I, I, Dean can, Dean is an avatar. I mean, the guy was playing saxophone. The dude was ridiculous. (laughs) And he, and he, and I mean, obviously he could fit into any musical setting, but I want you to talk yeah. specifically about Cooch's. You talk about Lou Adler and Peter Asher and obviously like James and Carol. Okay, that's fine. But I want to know how you involved yourself because rock was still a very new concept, really. I mean, the early 70s, not as much as the the mid-60s, but a lot of the old arrangers did not know how to arrange for rock tunes. Like you said, when you, can you talk about how you contributed to the arrangement of songs outside of, you know, the, the Titans of Taylor and you know, how you, because I mean, you were steeped in soul, like you said, first generation blues and rock. Right. That's right. So, I mean, how, how, how you weren't just there like a, like a lump on a log. I mean, to me, like what Dean was saying to me was that, a lot of times they would be the ones arranging a lot of these tunes uh, because the producers didn't, they'd say, the producer would say, play that Curtis Mayfield thing or play that swamp thing. They wouldn't even know what it was, you know? Well, the fact is that, and all the session cats will tell you this, a lot of times session musicians end up basically producing the album or mm-hmm. the record, this, whatever it is, because they're the, they're the ones that know how to come up with something. Uh, produ- you know, a lot of producers, especially back in the day, this is especially true, in the early days of this stuff, right up to the wrecking crew. They called the wrecking crew and they, they knew how to make up parts. They would recharge, but they knew how to, they knew what to do. And the same with the guys from my generation. A lot of times the producer would, had no idea what he wanted and no idea how to express to you what to do. So, but he called us because we're supposed to know. <laughs> and we did. And largely we did. But if you talk to all of us, you talk to Leland or Russ or any of the guys doing dates in that period, a lot of times, all the time, we had to make up our own stuff, and that's what we were called on to do. That's what we were being paid to do is come up with groovy stuff that arrangers would not have thought of. Would, did you feel like that started with James and Carol, or did that happen after you had a re- – like sort of belt began building a reputation? I just would love a time when you walked in – and I think that's the other part of it. I mean, not that – I mean, thank God you guys are all like – 
pretty you know well off financially you're not starving to death but a lot of musicians would say a lot of the cats would say they came in and never got paid for all the stuff you're talking about the arranging and the, and they were it was assumed they would do it i think tackett told me that you know you'd come in you get paid you get paid for the date as a as a studio cat but you wouldn't get paid for all the other work you were expected to do i mean is there a moment you can point to when you came in the producer had no idea what was going on and the record became incredibly successful i don't know man you know that, that's all this is a long time ago and i can't really point out instances but i can tell you generally speaking a lot of the time unless you had really brilliant producers like peter asher or lou adler um and even they would hire hire us to play like we actually play so you know again i'm not sure what the answer to that is what i would say is that if you want to be paid as an arranger or a producer then get the job of arranger and producer before you go in you know, insist on it or ask for triple scale, which I, I used to do all this. Used to ask for double, triple scale because we knew we were going to have to uh, do a lot more work than just, you know, play simple parts. So that, that would be the question. Let me tell you something. Be a record producer. There's only one qualification to be a record producer. And if somebody pays you to be a record producer, that's it. Hmm. That's it. That's the only qualification. If you're being paid to be a record producer, you're a record producer. And so some... Some of those guys are very brilliant, like David Kahn, he knows everything. You know, he can be, he's a multi-instrumentalist, he can write scores for orchestras, he can run pro tools, he can do everything. Then there's guys that just come in and say, okay, I'm going to hire these guys and these guys and these guys, and then they spend the rest of the time on the phone getting another gig. So, there's every different way. Mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, just yeah so f setting aside the specifics, you would say that Lee, Russ, you, Dergy or that group by and large, would you say that outside of the, you know, the guys that had budgets for two weeks at a time that you were pretty much doing everything you were producing and arranging and, and doing your parts on all the records you were on? Not on all of them, but largely, yes, uh, that, that happened an awful lot. And anybody doing dates at that period of time will tell you the same thing. The musicians were a, a lot was expected of. Right, and there was a lot of work, so maybe you were just okay with taking. I mean, I'm sure there was some rumbling under the under your under your breath about like, why are we getting compensated for this? But, I mean, that to me is one of the best kept secrets is that you're on these albums, uh, Etta James, Fugs, whatever it is. I mean, you know, whatever it is. Yet and yet you're listed as playing different instruments and stuff, but actually you were outside of maybe. I mean, were you writing lyrics for people too? No, I wasn't writing lyrics at that time. I was, write, I was writing lyrics, but not for other people. I'm writing them for myself. And occasionally, my songs would get covered by these, uh, you know, by, by artists. But uh, I wasn't, when, when I would go to do record dates, I would go in and, and, and uh, go and play and do what I was asked to do. Um, the writing came later, you know, uh, and I became, uh, I did well with writing, fortunately. But that was later. Well, I mean, talk about that. I mean, for writers, I mean, you have to have a story to tell. I mean, I think the issue today is there's not enough Lester Youngs to say to people um, who get up on the bandstand and either are singing about something in a vacuum or like just playing all these incredible notes and facility. The idea is what's, what story do you have to tell? And I just would hope you could talk to the audience a little bit about how you've really learned to, in your own authentic way, tell the Danny Korchmar story. Well, you know, I never saw it in particularly that way. Uh, in terms, of, I never saw it. I was telling the Danny Korchmar story, and I don't think most writers sit down with that in their mind. I think what you want to do is be honest, to write lyrics that you feel and that mean something to you. In other words, you're not just writing to to uh, get a cover or to do right. this. You're, you're writing to to make a statement and to, uh, to you know to come up with something that's really going to get people going. That's that's what I always aim for with writing. But you got to remember, I've written with some of the best lyricist you know of my generation and so i learned a tremendous amount from them but i don't think any of these guys sit down and go i'm going to tell this story but they do anyway james taylor's songs especially his early ones are all right from his life they're all what happened a lot of times he just writes down what happened and uh, fire and rain is like that that everything in that song happened i know and, uh, i know <laughs> uh, well, maybe down. maybe the better part is what is what does honesty mean to Danny Korchmar? Is there a song on the new album or the one you made before the pandemic that that reflects an honest expression of 
of uh, not you, but what does honesty mean to you, and how does it play out in your work? All right, all the songs that 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 um, that I wrote that immediate family do are totally honest, and they're all you know from the heart, and they're not trying to do anything other than be honest and tell the, and you know and come up with some, uh, something good, something meaningful, something that that's going to going to mean something to people. But again, you don't start with that. You start with do I like it? You know, right. you, you, you have to please yourself. You, you've got to write stuff. You go, oh, this is good. Uh, this is not so good. I've written whole lyrics, worked on it for days, and then thrown the whole thing out. And I'm sure any other good songwriter has done the same thing. Uh, you know, you got to be hard on yourself. But uh, again, if you think too much about your personal statement or these grandiose uh, lofty goals, you're not going to get anywhere. You just got to hit it. You know, John Lennon wrote uh, Imagine, I think, what, 20 minutes? And, uh he just sat down and wrote it. So, do you find your? Yeah, no, I mean that, that's totally true. I mean, you don't go in with any expectations. But was there a point when, like you said, the writing came later? But was there a point where, you know, you were trying to force it, and then you, you know, there was a, it was a, there was a, a moment when you realized that it wasn't really working, and um, you became more heart centered in your writing. Mm-hmm. Well, you know. Uh, again, like I said, like I was saying earlier, you got to be really hard on yourself, and you got to to know when you're you're headed in the right direction, and know when you're not, and to change directions or give up or stop or whatever, you know. And you got to go by feeling. It's entirely by feeling, uh, and you know, does it work? This is this is this. Do I like it? Is it getting to me? The only the only uh, criteria I have for songwriting is generally is it, is it getting to me? Do I like it? Do I think it's great? Not is it a hit? Not is it going to mean something to someone else do i like it and that's my criteria and that and you feel like that's all that's been the the, since you started writing that's always been the way it's been or that that has evolved over time well pretty much i mean again i had no choice it's not a decision i made it was just the way it worked out that's all i had to go by um when i started working with don henley and i sit down and try to come up with uh, music that I think he could write to. I'd come up with something that that made that. I say, oh, this is this has got a groove. It's and it's, it's interesting. And I think Hanley will dig this. Hanley will be able to write to this. Then I play it for him. And if he said, yeah, I can write to that, we'd start recording right away. Ah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I got one more voice to play for you, Coach. I don't expect you to know who it All is, right. but take a listen. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe I can just do it best by describing what a recording session was like as opposed to, you know, come on up here and we'll fix it. Mm-hmm. It was all about pre-production, not post-production. When we did the band's Big Pink album, for instance, we took every song and said, well, how can we better this song? How can we better this section? What's appropriate for this section? How do these instruments fit together? Uh, you know, how do the voices fit? What... And, that, and let's get it so we can play it great. And then once we got, got it so we can play it great, we just practice it over and over and over and over again. And then we're ready to to uh, roll the tape. But uh, that's not that doesn't seem to be. The, I mean, I that I spent too much time in recording studios with bands who didn't have it together and who spent time uh, in front of the microphone, you know, wasting everyone's money and time while they practiced. So. It was all about pre-production and not post-production then. Was that... I don't know. Did you ever have the chance to work with um, is, uh, John Simon? Well, that, that sounds definitely like John Simon right there. That that, that was, no, that was John Simon. That was, I'm sorry. That was, I should have right. given you a chance to guess. Uh, did you work right. with him? No, I never, I never did work with him. But obviously I loved those band records just like everybody else. Um, well, I want to. So, again, that that yeah. process. He's right about pre-production. We used to do that on the stuff we did with Peter Asher, with James and Linda. We would go in and rehearse for a week or so, and then we would, and then we record record the whole stuff pretty quickly, and then go on the road with Linda or James or you know Carol or whoever. So uh, there was pre-production, but again, it depends on you know with the band. Those guys were playing together for years. I would think they knew pretty much what they were doing before John Simon came into the picture, but maybe I guess I'm wrong. It's hard for me to imagine Levon or, or Garth Hudson having to go over and over and over songs. Those guys are really, really good musicians, but to each his own. Everybody's got their own way of doing things. 
and that was probably necessary because those records sure do sound great. They were playing as the Hawks and things like that, but the they those Brown album, Big Pink, seminal records. It just was amazing to me. I mean, you're how, you would do a week in the studio uh, of working out. Um, like, could you just talk a little bit about what you would specifically work on, and then and then ultimately, truthfully, like once the record button went on. That was it, pretty much. There was no overdubbing after that. I mean, that, to me, like, that is, you brought up before, it's not the, a Pro Tools issue. A lot of it's a source issue, whereas the miking and, you know, the, the, the new recording sound. But part of the other right. issue is, like, I, I could listen to music today coming out of speakers before a show, and I don't care what the message is or how good the groove is. There's so many layers on the post-production, it's sterilized. And I just wonder, well, yeah. Well, that's 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 um, bad production. If you layer too much stuff on, you throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's that's then somebody ain't driving the bus right. You know, you gotta have space in your records for the rest of the stuff to come through. Give me an example. Talk people talk about the, a big a big drum sound, that John Bonham drum sound. Now Bonham was a hard hitter, but the reason you can hear his drums is the guitars aren't pounding away, pounding away in the mid range because that'll cover everything up. Exactly. If you turn those Marshall amps up and the guitars pounding away playing. You know, big power chords, and, and that's going to drown out the drums. You got to, you know, you got to find arrange stuff, which Led Zeppelin was brilliant at. You know, you know Jimmy Page and and uh, John Paul Jones were great arrangers. So they arrange stuff so you can fucking hear the drums. That's it, man. You know, do it, uh, do it on the first day. So wait till later, and don't try to cover it up with a bunch more overdubs. If you don't have it, then then uh, you can stack as much overdubs as you want, and it's still going to be crap. And uh, I hear a lot of records where they just stuffed everything in there and, and uh, went, went less would have been a lot better. So that's just, again, my personal taste. You know? Can you talk about the, the album the Immediate Family Band did? Did you guys do first takes and that was it? No, well, you know, sometimes. Some of the stuff is first or second takes and some of it was three or four or five takes, you know. Um, uh, it was all over the place, but we worked very quickly. We got the album that's about to come out, we basically recorded all the basic tracks in three days. And that's seventeen tunes. Um, no, that, that, that's really what I. That, that's what I meant. I meant uh, I, I didn't phrase it rightly. I mean, what I meant was was there minimal post production? Well, there no, there was considerable post production, but not in terms of dumping tons and tons of stuff on there. I won't let that happen to my song. I want to know. And, I want to uh, know what you guys. Uh, that's this is important because I know with the Fugs and you listen to late '60s stuff. You're on. You were in and out of the studio. At maybe a, there was an overdub once or twice. That was it. So what do you prioritize in post-production? What's the Cooch Manifesto for that? Well, the things we do with immediate family is mainly vocals. We work really hard on vocals. Uh, so, and that, that that is a lot of our post-production situation. And then, you know, maybe we double the rhythm part or something like that. I don't like doubling everything, which is an 80s trick, you know. Uh, we don't double stuff unless it's really going to help. And, and uh we're careful about, about pre-production. There's also percussion. I love percussion. So Russell does a lot of percussion on our stuff to uh, pump up the jam a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's about it. I'm trying to think now. You know, no, there isn't a ton of – we don't dump a ton of stuff on there. Um, Do you, you find, you know, though, that – you're a, talking about, like, voc- like, like, like multiple harmonies or actually, like, you don't – you just play the rhythm tracks first and then you'll, you'll sing in the post-production. Like, you'll, you'll sing after. That's right. Yeah, we sing afterwards and generally do our guitar solos after. And you like that? In, in, yeah, yeah, it's a good way to go. Mm-hmm. What that is, way you concentrate on getting the track, the basic track going, and the, and the groove of it, and the forward motion of it, and then you can and you can concentrate on the solos and maybe uh, take your time with those. Mm-hmm. When you look back, um, I mean, you said you always said you're like I have a huge ego, um, even though you get out of the way when you know you hear a good song, but you're also a really good cat. You always try to keep the vibe high. You've always surrounded yourself with people that feel the same way. And I just wanted you to talk to younger cats. I'm 43, my generation and younger, definitely the millennials are, uh, I can already tell, uh, like deer in the headlights uh, coming out of this thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's unprecedented, uh, the touring infrastructure is gone unless you have some big name like, you know, Journey or Steve Miller, Tower of Power, Immediate Family Band. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I just wanted you to, not that you have a roadmap, but what kind of, what does your gut tell you about the way forward? And this is the key, not for people that have a reputation. What's your advice to creative, authentic cats about the way to move forward to be able to sing for your supper playing original music? All right, well, there's several different ways of recording music now. One of them is uh, bedroom pop, which it's all done on a computer in somebody's bedroom. <laughs> bedroom and a lot pop, of records, too. <laughs> yeah. And a lot, a lot of records like that are very good. I think uh, Billy Eilish's stuff is terrific. It's well, very well done. And that was done in a place about the size of, of my dining room. Um, and uh, then there's bands. What I miss is bands that record where they're all playing together at the same time. And I'm hoping that comes back, as opposed to doing everything piecemeal, where you know uh, the drums are done, and then the bits, and the bass is done, and then the guitars are done. I like the idea of a band playing together, and I don't hear that a lot <clears throat> anymore. And certainly not in pop music. Pop music seems at this point to be all computerized, and all about beats more than more than songs. But there are stuff. There are there still are songs. Uh, this little girl, Olivia Rodrigo's had this song about driving lessons, and that's great. But I, you know, I'm not a kid. I, I can't relate to that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm an no, old man. No, I mean, you, you know, know what it is like, the, but I mean, little kids. but that's, I think I, I children, you know. absolutely. No, I mean, uh, listen, I mean, it's, I think what I'm, what I'm, you know, there's no intellectual property rights anymore. You could have 15,000 downloads of a song. You're getting 14 cents. You're, there's no studio, vibrant studio scene anymore. So the only way that creatives and bands that are still, I mean, there are some in, in great bands out there. And I know, I know you love bands, but the only way that you yep. make money now, Cooch, is going on tour, being a road dog, and it's the merch tables. You don't even get paid for the very well for the gigs. And I want you to hearken back. I mean, there is no domestic, to, domestic touring circuit, or it's slowly coming back. I mean, I just, mm -hmm. you know, that to me is the most concerning thing about moving forward because as a musician, the only way you're even going to make a living is by road dogging it. And that's sort of the idea, like, I, I was just hoping you could go back and think about your days of road dogging because, I mean, the record companies were footing the bill for these 40 city tours that you would go on with Crosby Nash and open up. Even if people didn't show up, they'd still write it off as a loss because the records were making so much money. And now mm -hmm. the bands have to promote themselves, bring in the people. I mean, it's almost, I guess, Cooch, like what do you hope fundamentally has changed psychically amongst the bean counters in order for music to still be seen as a viable profession? Well, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a fraught question you got right there. Uh, <laughs> You know, for music to be, you know, like what all of us say when asked, well, what do, you, what do you suggest? What's your advice to young musicians? And we all say the same thing is quit, get another job. Right, wow. Do something else. Because you can't depressing. make money playing music. Yeah, very, very difficult to make money playing music. And one thing Leland would say, for instance, is learn everything you can. Learn how to read, fly shit. Learn how to play any style. Learn how to play anything. What I would say is, and this is probably old school stuff, but uh, I would, I would um, uh, pa paraphrase Dave Grohl, who said, you know, find some of your pals in the neighborhood, you know, set up an amp in your garage, find somebody who can play drums in your neighborhood, get them over and start bashing away. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. What you'll find is that it's a lot of fun. And what you'll also find is that you'll suck, you'll be terrible, and then you'll get a little bit better. And then you'll get a little bit better after that. And then maybe a little bit better if you stay with it. And then it becomes more fun. We all know that doing something you're good at is more fun than doing something you stink at. So, you know, do it until you get better and have fun with it. And, and the money will either come or it won't come. The main thing is that burning desire to play music. And if you have it, you've got to do it. Music, the only reason to do music is if you can't do anything else in your soul. You know, if it's so buried deep in your soul that you can't do anything else, then you pursue it with dogged determination. But if you're just fucking around, find something else, man. Right. So, you, I mean, you're talking about kind of just punk rocking it, get in the shed, get the egg crates up, starts bashing yeah. away. But but that's not so. Yeah. But how? Yeah. OK. So um, what has been the most when you get back on the bandstand? I know it's going to probably feel like the same. No time is necessarily passed. But I mean, you've lost a lot of we've lost. I mean, I lost my best friend at 50 years old. The The, the, the pandemic took away a lot of people it's very real 
it's not even past us yet. And I just wonder, like, mm. do you feel like you can sort of – have you grown as, as a person? Like, what has changed for you? Will you ever take anything for granted again? Well, of course I've grown as a person, you know. <laughs> At this, I, I, would, I would hope. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd hope I've grown as a person and as a musician, you know. Hmm. What was the second part of your question? I just what are you what are you going to – I mean, what is the, the – what are you going to bring to the bandstand that maybe was – I don't want to say lacking before, but just the idea of like uh, uh, humble gratitude, if any of that stuff comes into play, just because there's just, we're, we're just, and not as it's not only been like a suffering time. It's just, we're so broken, man. Like our whole system is so broken and it's so demoralizing for my daughters. And I mean, I like, I'm doing my show. I continue to do it because it feeds me. I can sing for my supper barely. But the point is that, you know, if someone took the mic away from me for 16 months, I would be in not the best shape in the world. And I just cite, I just wonder if there was one sort of adjective or, or word that you would describe that you would come back with that maybe wasn't necessarily present in you before. What would it be? You mean after the before and after the pandemic? Yeah. Is that what you're yeah. going for? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, <clears throat> not much. I mean, you know, my when the pandemic hit, it wasn't like I sat down and said, oh, I'm going to use this time to do this or that. Hmm. But I did find myself writing because now I have a band to write for. With me, it's always been, you know, I need an outlet for you if I'm going to write songs, an outlet for those songs. That's why I like the idea of telling people to go into the garage. You know, if you have a band, you're in a band, then you'll go home and write a song so that your band can play it. Right. You know, it's a very simple, simple basic process, you know, on that level. What I did was I, I played a lot of guitar. I hadn't been playing as much guitar as I wanted to before that, but I really sat down and really started working on my chops, um, which are, you know, at this point, real good. Um, so uh, you, you just use the time the best you can. Listen, we're all in the same boat. It's terrible. And this is not just happening to the music business. It's happening to our entire culture, as well you know. We're, in, we're not in good shape here. We've got, we're living in a country that's divided right down the middle. And at one side, it hates the other side's guts. That's not a, a good environment to create music in or, to, or, or anything. And let's hope that after the pandemic, then let's hope music has plays a role in healing people and bringing people together. That would be very nice, you know. I'm sorry, am I wandering too far off Co here? Cooch, I mean, you're so on point. Dude, you're on, I just, I, is there a way, you, you've always made these salient points that I have to go back and listen to, but when did music in your mind, when was the, f like an early time when you were like, Oh wow! It doesn't dictate our culture anymore. Like, was it around 1980, 85? Like, when did that start? Because, yeah. I mean, even during the Vietnam War, the music pushed a lot of that con pushed a lot of it through. The music was so good, and you used and mm -hmm. you said it doesn't dictate our culture. And I agree with you. And I just wonder when that that sort of depressing reality went off for you. Well, you know, when it became big business. Obviously, right. when the music business became huge business, when people realized, hey, there's millions of dollars to be made here, that's when everything changed. And as, as we know, after Carol had her huge hit and um, um, Pete Trent had his huge hit, the, the lawyers and the bean counters started to say, hey, there's a lot of money here. And we can't just let a bunch of hippies fuck around with it. You know, we gotta, we got to monetize everything. And so that's when it started. And then music became more about trying to... Uh, get on the radio and please arbitrary people. And then it became about telling the truth. Now it was like that before the sixties, you know, pop music in the, in the fifties and early sixties was all about, let's get a hit, get on the radio next, you know, then, in, then it became an art form. And I use that in quotes, because, <laughs> you know, dubious term, you know? Oh dude. I, I like mean, it's so it spot on, people. man. No, I mean, the, 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 right. also I just, I, I need like Ernie Watts told me that in 1980, I mean, like when the Lynn drum machine came in, Harvey Mason would go in, Kunkel maybe, put a chip in, record their drum track, and then it was all like, I mean, after a while there were no humans playing the music hitting at the same time. And uh, well. did, please don't tell me that they never that they never put a chip on, on Cooch's sound. Did you, I mean, how did you, I mean, after a while did you, I just know people that walked away from from the Rusty Young, rest in peace. He was like, "I'm out, man." I did. That's that was what I wanted to talk to you about. He realized at a certain point, the efficiency model came in, and all they wanted him to do was fill a sonic space. They didn't want him to play himself. And I don't think you necessarily 
Did you walk? I mean, I know you went into production. I know you went into working with bands. Right. And, you know, but did right. you stop doing? Did you have did you actually walk away from studio work because it became so disheartening because it was such a formula trip? All right. Well, I'll tell you about that. Is that um, when I first came to LA, I was dying to do session work because my heroes were like the guys from Stax Volt and guys from Motown, and that's what I wanted. Was going and 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 cut, and and cut great songs with a great band day and night. And that's what I wanted to do. But when I got to L.A. and started doing dates, I realized that 85% of what I was playing on was crap. And I didn't have any and, and was not doing a thing for me. And uh, I never really threw myself into being a session player. Also, like I said, I do just my thing. I don't do, I don't do everything. And I don't want to do everything. You know, I'm a terrible snob having <laughs> grown up with great, great singers, songwriters, with playing with the very best people and playing the very best songs. So after you play with Jackson Brown and James Taylor, you don't want to play some shitty ass. Music, I do it. You know, I dig, it. man. I dig it. You know, <laughs> you, you, you develop an attitude, and all of us had it. All of us had an attitude of like, you know, ah, oh, geez. So if you want to just phone it in and become a studio sausage, and where you don't care what you're playing, you don't care what song you're playing. You're there for the hang. You're there for the money. You're there for other reasons than because you want to get involved in the song. You go play with Jackson Brown. You're not counting. You're not looking at your watch, and you're not counting your money. You're going. I'm going to play great songs today, and you throw yourself into it. You know, that's what I was interested in always. So uh, at, at some point, I got kicked upstairs. Don hired me to uh, collaborate with him as a writer and producer, and at that point, I stopped doing dates, and you know, I didn't miss it at all. Like I said, what year was what year was that? Be, what year was that? It was like eighty one. Yeah, this is so. So I mean, but you you would say that. When you when you alluded to before about triple scale, if somebody hired the boutique Korchmar, the niche cat Danny Korchmar, you would, and it was something that you were like, "This is crap." You would charge triple scale. It depends on who it was. It depends on whether the, the individual I was going to charge that for had the money to pay for it, and also if the, I, if it meant I was going to be doing uh, more than just playing the guitar. If it meant I was gonna be doing arranging and stuff like that, just like what you talked about earlier. Then I said, "Yeah, well, I'm going to need triple scale for that." And then you'd get like, silence on the other end of the phone. And let me call you back. They call you back. Okay, we'll pay you triple scale. And, uh, you know, things like that. Sometimes you, <laughs> you got to do that to wake, to wake people up. And a lot of times, the more money you charge, the more they love you, you know? Yeah, that's so, amazing, right? <laughs> that's, uh, that's bad. <laughs> We're so petrified. I'm, people are so petrified to ask for what, they're, what they deserve or what they're worth, you know? It's, it's, uh, you know, before, one, one final thing, Cooch. Uh, can you tell me how you um, – I feel like it was a connection through Spider and Chuck and, and, and maybe David Clayton, but how did you wind mm -hmm. up connecting with Etta James? Well, that was um, – I got called – Trevor Lawrence called me for that. He was the producer. On oh, that I love record. that guy, man. And, yeah, and Trevor uh, called a bunch of different people to play on that. Chuck and Spider were uh, on that date. My, my 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 brother Smitty William Smith, who's a wonderful wonderful musician. Oh my, rest in peace. I, you know, I just connected with Eric yeah. Mercury. Man, they go way back to Canada together. Right, Eric Mercury was all friends with him, and a lot of the, a lot of, there was a Canadian scene. There was a Canadian oh. uh, kind of group of people that came down, and they were all real strong players. And um, uh, so I think you know, hanging out with Smitty, I played. I used to jam with Smitty every day because we lived very near each other in, in Laurel Canyon. And we were, everyone I knew was jamming, was either recording, gigging, or jamming. And uh, so, you know, a bunch of people fell, fell in, kind of fell in with each other. And, uh, did you, did of, you, know, uh, did you know Trevor Lawrence back in New York? No. Yeah, because that dude no. was, I mean, I, I, yeah, you guys were there at the same time. Well, yeah, but I, wasn't, I never did record dates in New York. The only record dates I ever did in New York was playing on Carol and Jerry's demos. And that's actually how I learned to play on records was being taught by Carol how to play guitar parts on records, you know, and uh, outside, incredible education. Well, I mean, that mm -hmm. goes without saying. I mean, outside of San Juan Capistrano, can you talk about um, other shows? I mean, I'm, I'm dying to, to come and, 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 and see you guys play. Is there, is, there any, is there other shows on the books? Yeah, we're going to be going up and down uh, the coast. Um, oh, we're going to play, I think, the Coach Park and uh, a couple of other gigs. Uh, on the coast, four or five gigs. We're going to do one in Santa Barbara. So we'll be around. I was going to say, the one place you guys should check out is the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix. It's uh, mm -hmm. the, the CEO of Target owns it. They bring in 
all types of different – I mean, it's been there for quite a while, but if you're not going to make it to Tucson, I mean, Phoenix would be – the Musical Instrument Museum is a perfect place for the immediate family band. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, hire us and we'll come and play. <laughs> <laughs> Cooch, man, it was so good to hear your voice, man, and uh, be safe and uh, I look forward to, uh, to, to catching a hang and, and seeing you guys groove, man. Great, man. Right. Yeah, be cool. All right, Jake. Yeah, be cool. Yeah, you too. Thanks, right. man. Later, dude. All the best to you. All the best. Bye bye now. Later. Great to connect again with Danny Korchmar, total unsung cat, and uh, plays what he wants to play. He's had the reputation, he's earned it. That's it for the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you to Jim Parisi. We'll see you later.